it's very good and I'm honored to be here with such a wonderful array of people who have been studying the media. Like Sukumar, I would like to start by remembering Reuters photojournalist and uh, the Pulitzer Prize awardee, Danish Siddiqui, who died while covering the conflict in Afghanistan. His frames remind us that a journalist is about all, and I witnessed the times they are living in. Siddiqui held up a mirror to the situation that the country's leadership has brought us to. Perhaps that is why while the Afghan president condoled his death publicly, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has not so far. The question before us is uh, the status of media today. It's perhaps an unanswerable one because it implies that the status is relatively stable. But every day brings new evidence of the fragility and that status. As Dr. Rajan has just reminded us, we are in a period of flux and we never know what will happen next in the universe of the media. Unpacking that fragility would bring us to new realities that threaten the media status. The first aspect is its constantly changing topography. The internet has been seen and uh, other speakers have also highlighted the fact that it's a major source of disruption, modifying old forms of media, restructuring in the process social relations. Uh, they lend themselves to the articulation of hegemonic and counter hegemonic narratives and help individuals, social activists and collectivities gain visibility and voice. So we know that it has a social function. And, uh, but we know that this is not an unalloyed joy. And that is the, the point that we should now concentrate on. It was only in 2010 with the coming of 3G that the compact between the internet and the Indian, still that Indian was still male and urban, but it was there, he was there, a personality who could benefit from the internet. The number of internet users grew from 7 million in 2001 to 25 times that number over the next 12 years at a compounded rate of over 30% year on year. This may seem impressive in terms of numbers, but when you consider that the number of Indians on the internet rose by 47 million during the pandemic year, 2020 to 2021, you get an idea of the unstoppable speed with which change is being assured in. Today, they are, as of early 2021, 624 million internet users in India who represent about 45% of the population. And now that most welfare schemes, everything, education, health, everything has moved online. This number is bound to grow, even if people have to starve themselves to buy themselves a selfie. What the internet did to the media space was that it enabled media convergence that brought older and newer media together in ways and on a scale unimaginable earlier. The fact that the corporate entities stood to gain enormously from this convergence uh, is uh, you know, quite proved by the realities we live through today. Robert McChesney calls it the marriage of the internet to existing capitalism and goes on to say that the internet, the supposed champion of increased consumer power has today become one of the greatest generators of monopoly in economic history with new digital industries going from being competitive to oligopolistic to monopolistic at breakneck speeds. In India, the Reliance industry, and I think that it, um, I think Paneer referred to the uh, Reliance Industry Limited takeover of Network 18. Uh, this could be seen as a classic marriage of the internet to existing capitalism. With that one acquisition, India's biggest business house also became the country's largest media entity with political actors and social elites pushing for and achieving even greater integration of the Indian economy with markets. 
media convergence has had serious repercussions for unbiased content, freedom of expression, information, and all the more so because the country's mass media in their varying forms has always constituted a major site on which the Indian nation state has been imagined and contested and where power is made legitimate. I want us to note this. The thing to note is that even as corporate entities were tightening their grip on the Indian media, they became one of the primary, the media became one of the primary sites through which the government and ruling party did their perception building. This has we know been the cause of earlier governments too. And the censorship of the media was one of the cornerstones. Uh, the censorship of the media we know was uh, one of the cornerstones of Indira Gandhi's emergency. But no government or ruling party in living memory has shown as much ability, appetite, and sheer dogged effort to harness and control the media for their purposes, as the Modi government and the BJP have done. The Prime Minister himself, with 70 million Twitter followers, is among the world's foremost practitioners of mediated populism. He understood early and well the unique power that social media offered him of being able to avoid the scrutiny and critique of traditional media and talk directly, appeal directly to the people not just in the one to many ways of the older media like radio and television, but to seem to engage with a mass audience in an intimate way that speaks to their inner feelings and instincts. It paid, it paid huge electoral dividends as well. Rajdeep Sardesa in his book of the 2019 general election notes that with more than 300 million WhatsApp users, and an almost equal number of Facebook accounts at the start of the new election cycle, Team Modi was convinced that the 2019 election would be fought on smartphones. Analysts have characterized such efforts as exercises in people making through the proliferation of partisan online and social media. But they also note that this cannot easily be termed as participatory or democratizing. You know, it's very, uh, you know, people in a lazy way say internet deepens a democracy, but does it? And how does it? It's a question we should also ask. The world is watching India, as Paneer uh, Selvan rightly reminded us. Why India has been now dubbed as an electoral autocracy is an interesting question. And why has its media been downgraded to the 142nd slot is an even more interesting question. So in a way, to control people, you need to control the media, including the online space and social media. And one of the biggest factors disrupting the status of media today are these attempts to capture them. The arrogance inherent in that recent statement by the a newly appointed president of the Tamil Nadu unit that Pura um, uh, Gandhi just reminded us, is no accident. It's a reflection of the drive and desire of this government and ruling party to capture the media. The new IT rules, which has targeted small and independent digital portals like The Wire, is all about bringing the media under state control. Although it was sold to the citizen as government oversight with a soft touch, those were the words that Ravi Prasad had used, Ravi Shankar Prasad, in his earlier avatar as uh, <laughs> IT minister. He said it was meant to empower ordinary social media users, protect the dignity of women and children, fight fake news and child molesters while safeguarding the security of the nation. So it was, it was actually packaged as something that was good for the, the voter. Media watchers and practitioners, even at that stage, saw these rules as an important part of the architecture of a surveillance state that seeks to control and suppress independent media and media persons. They argued 
that they violate the right to freedom of expression in the Indian constitution and go beyond the provisions of the IT Act 2000 and go against the statement of the G17, which uh, the Modi government uh, you know, signed with great international acclaim some weeks ago. Today, these rules are being used in a way that violate all norms and guarantees. If evidence is needed for its dangerous potential, the actions of the Ghaziabad police would suffice. And we have all got notices from the Ghaziabad police. At the behest of the state government of Uttar Pradesh, without proper investigation into the incident, they arrived at the conclusion that the hate crime charge against an elderly Muslim man whose beard was cut off was fake and was intended to incite communal hatred, I put that within quotes, between religious groups and, again quotes, disturb the public order. They then went ahead and filed FIRs under various sections of the Indian Penal Code, as well as the new IT rules against a range of uh, journalists, as well as Twitter India. Wire was also named. The aim was to intimidate and hector independent media voices. And it has already had a decided chilling effect on free speech in the country and could be the beginning of a new raft of new cases across India. Any hope of ending this corporate political capture of the media and its status rests on the ordinary citizen. And, and here I don't refer to the transatlantic citizens that write love letters to Pani Selva. I'm saying it's when the ordinary Indian citizen realizes that they too are being captured in the process, that these attempts to shrink the spaces for independent media will come to an end because they have to realize it also means the shrinking of their rights and liberties. But there's also a worry that the minister had voiced earlier in this program about the cascading costs of exclusion wrought by the digital divide and how that will play out in the future in the scenario of corporate and authoritarian control is an important question. I have no answers for that. Anyway, I'll end here and uh, if there are any questions, happy to ask. Them.